Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. April's jobs report came in overwhelmingly lower than expected. President Biden and the Treasury Secretary comment on the stats. Biden's border policies are taking the heat from his own party. A Democratic congressman is accusing the administration of misleading people and playing a shell game with the border situation. Texans will soon be able to carry handguns without a permit. The governor says he'll sign the new gun bill that just passed the state legislature. Genetically modified mosquitoes have been released in the Florida Keys. Some say this will help combat the disease-carrying insects, while others warn it could bring untold troubles. An actor becomes an ambulance driver during India's second wave. A story of compassion and patriotism. President Biden said Friday that April's lower than expected job growth shows the U.S. economy is still struggling to recover from the pandemic. He argues that his family and job support bills are more needed now than ever. The U.S. economy added only 266,000 jobs in April, sharply below the 1 million that economists had forecast. According to Friday's Labor Department report, this is the weakest monthly gain since January, and the monthly unemployment rate also rose to 6.1 percent from 6 percent. President Biden argued that it would take more time for the economy to recover. This month's job numbers show we're on the right track. We still have a long way to go. As I said, my laser focus is on growing the nation's economy and creating jobs. My laser focus is on vaccinating our nation, and we're making continued progress. My laser focus is on one more thing, making sure working people in this country, hardworking people are no longer left out in the cold. Biden rejected the criticism that his large recovery package has incentivized people not to return to work. He says April's job data shows that his massive American family and job support bills are more needed than ever. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says she believes the U.S. will reach full employment next year. We knew this would not be a 100-day battle. And today's jobs report underscores the long-haul climb back to recovery. Democrats and Republicans diverge sharply on what's the best path to recovery for the economy. Biden is set to meet with congressional leaders from both parties next week to discuss his policy plan. And taking a different tone from the president, some experts are saying the April jobs report is very unusual and is worth looking into. NTD's Christina Kim speaks to a senior analyst on what he thinks may have happened. April's jobs report said the economy added 266,000 jobs, a huge difference from the anticipated 1 million figure. Joseph Trevisani, the senior analyst at FX Street, says this is certainly a very unusual situation. And in February, you had, I believe, 7.4 million unfilled jobs, according to the Jolts report. And yet, you only have a quarter million people hired in April. That seems a bit unusual, to say the least. Trevisani lists two possible reasons for this figure. The first is unemployment benefits. With the both extended and increased unemployment benefits, lower wage employees are simply not really motivated to go back to work. If you're going to have almost as much money or nearly as much money or a good proportion of your salary paid by unemployment, then what real incentive do you have to go back to work? The second reason could be that there was a statistical adjustment, but this number might be reverted in May. The unadjusted number of hires in April was 1.09 million. The adjustment reduced that by almost 750,000 down to the 266 that we saw. He says this type of adjustment accounts for seasonal changes based on what's historically taken place. Seasonality changes could refer to an increase in jobs in landscaping or construction in the spring or a loss in jobs in those same fields in the winter. Overall, Trevisani says it's not really clear what exactly is the reason behind the employment figures. But he says it's not an indication that the economy is slowing or that the job market isn't functioning. Christina Kim, NTD News. A Democratic congressman is suggesting that the Biden administration is misleading people about the border crisis. 
He accuses them of playing a shell game with migrant children. NTD's Allison Lee has the details. Democratic Congressman Henry Cuellar of Texas is speaking out against the Biden administration's border policies. In an interview with NBC Nightly News on Thursday, he said recently released photos showing nearly empty processing facilities in Donna, Texas are misleading. What they're doing now is they're moving the kids from the Border Patrol tents over to next door to the HSS facility. With all due respect, it's all a show game. On Monday, the Department of Homeland Security, or DHS, released photos of nearly empty migrant processing facilities taken on April 30th. They were lauding DHS action on the border, and their infographic reads, DHS has reduced the number of unaccompanied children in CBP custody by 88 percent since March 28, 2021. But Cuellar believes the photos and the data are misleading people into believing that the border crisis is under control. He explained in an interview with local media Border Report on Wednesday that DHS simply moved the children to facilities run by the Department of Health and Human Services, or HHS. You know, when they're saying that they got everything under control with the honor company kids, if you go to Donna, you have a tent that's run by Border Patrol. Then they set up maybe five tents that are run by HSS. The DHS also admits they are doing this. Their website says, these photos demonstrate the tremendous progress that DHS and its partners have made to safely and efficiently transfer unaccompanied children out of CBP custody and into the care of the Department of Health and Human Services. Cuellar has previously leaked photos of the overcrowded Donna processing facility back in March. In an interview with Fox News Rundown on Thursday, the Democratic congressman further disputed Biden's immigration policies. He says the administration should have repurposed the Trump-era Remain in Mexico policy and the agreements with Central American countries instead of simply getting rid of them. Allison Lee, NTD News. What if we could make it so mosquitoes can't spread diseases anymore? A biotech company genetically modified the insect in hopes of doing just that, but some say there could be unintended consequences. NTD's Christina Kim has that story. For the first time in the U.S., genetically modified mosquitoes have been released into the wild. Thousands of these mosquitoes were reportedly released in six locations in the Florida Keys, two on Kudjo Key, one on Ramrod Key, and three on Vaca Key. The project is led by UK-based biotechnology firm Oxitech, which is funded in part by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The project was approved by the Environmental Protection Agency, as well as several others. It's part of an effort to help tackle a disease-transmitting mosquito species called the Aedes aegypti, which account for about 4% of the mosquito population in the Keys. Oxitec says that species is responsible for virtually all mosquito-borne diseases transmitted to humans. The species transmits diseases like dengue, Zika, and yellow fever, and they can also spread potentially deadly diseases to animals as well. We speak to Barry Ray, the director of the Florida Keys Environmental Coalition, for his take on the issue. He's been involved in this process for the last 10 years. And he says the biggest issue isn't about genetic modification. It's about the process, which Ray says wasn't normal. We're disappointed, to say the least. You know, we um, we, we don't live in fear of genetically modified organisms. We li- live in fear of bad science. Male mosquitoes don't bite. But females do, spreading disease in the process. These modified male mosquitoes have been released. And once they mate with unmodified female mosquitoes, they'll pass on a lethal gene. Theoretically, the resulting female offspring would die before maturity, controlling the population. He believes the process was tainted by politics, and the standard to investigate the technology was lowered. We asked them for a simple mathematical standard question Show me your equation for what a statistically significant sample size is for testing eggs to determine no no females will be produced. They don't have one. Ray says this type of large-scale modification is now released into the wild, and it can't be undone. This is concerning, he says. The off-target mutations that happen when you edit the germline, the heredity that, that you know is going to occur, it is concerning because as those evolutionary things start to distort that and and they manifest into new characteristics, we haven't studied that. There are no long-term studies. 
If successful, some 20 million additional genetically modified mosquitoes will be released later on in the year. Christina Kim, NTD News. Texas is one step closer to allowing its citizens to carry handguns in public without a permit. The Texas Senate passed a bill some call constitutional carry. It's said to strengthen Second Amendment rights. NTD's Jason Perry has the story. After several hours of debate, the Texas Senate passed a bill on Wednesday that will allow Texans to carry handguns in public without obtaining a license or training. Texas Republican committeeman Stephen Stanley says Texans were stripped of their rights to carry a handgun without a permit 150 years ago. Back in 1871, uh, the legislature back then took the rights away for us to constitutionally carry a sidearm. You could still carry a long gun, rifle, uh, you know, AR-15. You know, you could still carry that, you know, without having any kind of a permit. It just took our rights away, our constitutional rights away, to carry a pistol without asking the government for permission to do so. The constitutional carry bill still needs to go back to the House and then be signed by Governor Greg Abbott before it becomes law. And he said he'll sign it. Stanley, who also served as chairman for the state Republican Party's constitutional carry subcommittee, says legalizing constitutional carry in Texas might not be so easy because of possible amendments added to the bill by the Texas Senate. And if an amendment from the Senate gets attached to it that is found by a point of order non-germane to the original intent of the bill, it could, it could, it could stop the whole process and basically kill the bill. Groups against constitutional carry argue this will make it easier for bad people to get guns and take away the background check normally required for getting a permit. Well, if a woman had had their constitutional rights, so they didn't have to go to government and say, hey, mother, may I have a, have my, my gun? You know, if they just were able to have that right, then they can they can depend on themselves and not have to worry about depending on others. So far this year, Iowa, Tennessee, Montana, Utah and Wyoming have all passed legislation allowing some form of permitless carry. Reporting by Jason Perry, NTD News. The Texas House advances a bill to improve election security. This as Florida's new election law immediately faces a court challenge. The Texas House voted 81 to 64 in favor of a bill to change the state's election laws. Democrats tried to delay it by proposing over 130 amendments. 20 of them were ultimately adopted. The House bill is considered more moderate than what the Texas Senate passed. The two bills still need to be unified in a committee before they can head to the governor's desk. Texas Governor Greg Abbott is expected to sign the final version. Democrats complain that the changes will make it harder for minorities to vote. Republicans say they're designed to prevent fraud. One significant change prevents officials from sending out unsolicited mail-in ballot applications. At the same time, Florida's new election law is headed to court in two separate lawsuits. Prominent Democrat attorney Mark Elias is leading one of them. The NAACP is part of the group that filed another. The suits claim the law discriminates against minorities, the disabled and senior voters. The suits take aim at ballot drop box security and new rules that block third parties from collecting absentee ballots. The Office of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis says the claims are meritless and grossly misrepresent the legislation. The governor's office tells the Epoch Times Florida's new election reforms make it easy to legally vote but hard to cheat. We look forward to defeating these baseless claims in court. Maricopa County officials are refusing to turn over subpoenaed routers to election audit staff. They say it's over security and privacy issues. Officials in Maricopa County say they can't provide access to router information subpoenaed for an audit of the 2020 election. The Maricopa County Attorney's Office sent a letter to audit liaison Ken Bennett Monday. It says they can't produce the routers or router images without endangering sensitive information. The letter says the information could endanger law enforcement and release private health information and social security numbers of residents. The attorney's office says they are looking for a safe way to release the information, but they have not found a solution. Maricopa County originally fought the subpoena from the Arizona State Senate, but a judge ruled that they have to comply. The subpoena includes all of the electronic equipment. 
Bennett tells KFYI, they told me personally weeks ago that they had taken all the routers and the internet connections and the hubs and everything out of the building so they could send it to us. He says the router logs were supposed to prove that none of the election equipment was connected to the internet. But he says, lo and behold, they don't show up in the equipment that they said would be delivered to us. The audit was supposed to be completed on May 14th. Bennett says the audit may now take longer. More charges for the four former police officers in the George Floyd case. A federal grand jury has just indicted all of them, saying they violated Floyd's constitutional rights. The four former officers include Derek Chauvin, Thomas Lane, Jay Kung, and Tu Tao. All of them now face new federal charges for failing to provide medical care to Floyd. Chauvin, Tao, and Kung are also charged with violating Floyd's constitutional right to be free from unreasonable seizure and excessive force. The federal charges come in addition to their state charges. This means the four former officers could potentially face new trials before federal court. Jurors in a Minnesota court found Chauvin guilty for murder and manslaughter last month. He will face sentencing late next month. The other three former officers will face trial on state charges in August. And the Federal Election Commission has dropped its investigation into whether former President Trump broke campaign finance rules in 2016. And Trump responded, calling the case phony and based on lies. Here's the details. The FEC announced Thursday that it's dropped the investigation into whether Trump violated election laws with the $130,000 payment made by his then-attorney, Michael Cohen, to adult film star Stormy Daniels in 2016. In its announcement, the FEC said it failed by a vote of 2 to 2 to find reason to believe that Donald J. Trump knowingly and willfully violated federal election law. Republican and Democrat-aligned commissioners were divided over the case, and the Democrats criticized the decision to drop the case. Trump, on the other hand, thanked the commission Friday for, quote, ending this chapter of fake news. Daniels had claimed that the 2016 payment was intended to keep her quiet about an alleged sexual encounter with Trump. Cohen claimed that he made the payment at Trump's direction, but Trump has repeatedly denied the encounter and knowledge of the payment. In his Friday statement, Trump said the investigation was a case built on lies from Michael Cohen, a corrupt and convicted lawyer, a lawyer in fact who was so corrupt he was sentenced to three years in jail for lying to Congress and many other things having nothing to do with me. Trump made the statement from his new social media platform. A school in Pennsylvania is divided over the name and imagery of its mascot. One side says it's culturally offensive, while the other says it carries a lot of history and meaning for the school. NTD's Don Tran has the details. In Wayne, Pennsylvania, a school board voted to remove the name and look of Radnor High School's mascot. The school is no longer the home of the Raiders and does not use Native American imagery. Some people at the school thought the mascot was offensive to Native Americans. Others agree with taking out the Native American imagery, but oppose removing the name Raider. They say the name means something different to the school, and it carries a lot of history and importance. Co-founder of Moms for Liberty, Tina Deskovich, says discussions on whether to change names or not are valid. When it comes to these changing, you know, it's happening all over the country with schools and um, auditoriums, you name it, everything's being renamed these days. Um, I think it's a very localized decision. There might be some legitimate concerns about renaming, but it's a community's decision. I don't think there's a blanket, easy answer to that solution until you get all stakeholders in a community discussing what their concerns are and you move forward as a community. At some point, students who supported keeping the name Raider were attacked online and in some cases were labeled white supremacists. Deskovich says this is unacceptable. Uh, There are legitimate Um, concerns on both sides of every argument. And I think everybody should uh, be able to be heard without, it it seems like those that don't want to debate or don't know how to debate or don't have the facts to debate, just bring it right down to name calling. And that just shuts down communication. It leaves one side unheard and the results of that are, are never good. A petition that asks to lose the Native American imagery but keep the name has gained over 2,400 signatures. And when the committee tasked with finding a new name put out a survey, about 75% of responders supported keeping the name. John Wu, a local resident and Chinese immigrant, says the changing of names at the school is similar to what the Chinese Communist Party did in the past. I think uh, this is serious, you know, because we we came from China. We know that uh, 
cultural revolution will not end up just the <laughs> culture, you know. They have, uh, they, they eventually, you know, it will affect our daily life, you know. A list of 56 new names has gone down to eight for more feedback from a committee and focus groups involved in the process. A final decision on the nickname is expected sometime in June. Don Tran, NTD News. India's COVID surge hasn't let up, but buried deep beneath news of infections and death is a story of compassion and patriotism. NTD's Miguel Moreno has a story of an actor turned ambulance driver. India's in a bad situation. The country's reporting a terrible surge in COVID cases and deaths, record high numbers again this week. But working amidst the disease, fear and panic is Arjun Gowda, an actor turned ambulance driver, now dedicated to getting the infected and the dead where they need to go for free. You became an ambulance driver to help during this crisis. How does it feel to do what you're doing right now? Uh, this is what you're supposed to do when your people need it. Uh, you're not supposed to care for, uh, you're not supposed to think of uh, doing something like this. Uh, you have to get into the field. Uh, you have to make things work for you and your people. So this feels great for me. Part of the job, he says, is cremating people, which is traditionally done in the open. Gouda says a philanthropist gifted him an ambulance after seeing the actor give a hand in the pandemic. His family and friends have also aided him in his cause. He told me he plans to offer this life-saving service until the end, even if he becomes well-established in the film industry. I don't care. I keep one ambulance with me. I make sure it is going for a free service every day. Uh, to uh, to fulfill the needs of people who are in need. So this is going to be with me till my last breath. And his message to the people of India. When time comes like this, don't get panic. Uh, never ever think twice. Never ever get into depression. Never ever think about tomorrow. Don't ever leave in your mind. Leave for the present. When you get an opportunity to give something back, to your people, to your country, go for it. Stay strong, go for it. Gauda has starred in several films like Yubarathna and Wow. Ironically, he says he usually plays the bad guy. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. And up next, New York City's school's chancellor says the test to get into specialized high schools is racist. Not because of the test itself, but because of the outcome of the test. And one spa in New Jersey is hoping to inspire the community by helping celebrate the elderly as life returns to normal. Stay tuned for more here on NTD News. New York City Schools Chancellor says she wants fewer Asian American students in the city's specialized high schools. She says she's trying to bring about more diversity. NTD's Arian Pazdar has the story. If you want to go to one of the eight specialized high schools in New York City, you simply have to take a test while you're in middle school, and if you're good enough, you will get in. But according to the school chancellor, that's racist because most of the students who pass the test are Asian. And she says that doesn't represent her students fairly. Less than 4% of students at the city specialized high schools are African American. So the school's chancellor wants to get rid of the admissions test altogether. Over 50% of students at those high schools are Asian American. A group of people who attended a rally in Manhattan say they earned their right to be there. They spend long, longer hours in school, they have discipline, badly behaved students cannot stay in the classroom, their parents are dedicated to the education of their students. One rally attendee came to the U.S. in 1976. She says the specialized high school admissions test changed her life. After four years in New York, I took the test and, um, you know, earned a score high enough to get into Bronx High School Science. So I went there and it, um, it changed my life. You know, I made, I made friends. I had an excellent education. She added that being able to go to that school paved the way for a middle-class life in New York City. 
A lot of the people who came here today aren't even Asian or don't have kids in school, but they still believe that education is important and if you work hard for it, you should be rewarded rather than penalized. Arian Pastar, NTD News, New York. How much money would you pay to be famous? For a Baltimore rapper, the answer appears to be $4 million. But his pursuit of fame has landed him in jail. NTD's Lynn Lynn has that story. 33-year-old rapper Chad Arrington from Baltimore, Maryland, is sentenced to two and a half years in federal prison. This after stealing $4 million from his company to promote his music. One of his songs has nearly 22,000 views on YouTube. But according to federal prosecutors, the rapper used his company's credit card to pay online streaming platforms. He artificially increased the number of plays and purchased likes and followers across social media. Arrington also bought billboards across the country to promote himself, including one in Times Square. Another billboard promoted his social account and said, I will teach you how to be rich. The rapper was a search engine optimization expert. He and his friends used software to change credit card billing statements and forged a supervisor's signature. The company's financial loss forced 10 of his co-workers to take pay cuts. Arrington pled guilty on Wednesday. Aside from spending time in jail, he will also have to face three years of supervised release and pay back the over $4 million he stole. Lin Lin, NTD News. After a year of isolation, one New Jersey grandmother is getting a surprise Mother's Day gift she'll likely never forget. NTD Sapphire Quarter has the story. One spa in New Jersey is giving back to the woman who gave us everything. After over a year of dealing with the pandemic, one grandmother was given a much needed spa day free of charge. Perry Farstian's daughter and granddaughter told her they were going out to lunch. Happy Mother's Day. Um, so she's going to go ahead and get a facial and a mini massage. Her daughter says it might be the first facial her mother has ever gotten. She looks relaxed now, but Fars Jan, who doesn't speak fluent English, had much of her social network taken away during the pandemic. So it's been kind of a very difficult year, a little bit rough for her. After hearing about Fars Jan's isolation from her granddaughter, the spa's owner decided to treat her. For me, uh, something so small is sometimes so big. Ebrahimi says it feels really good to be able to help. As a mother, she understands the stress that families experience in the pandemic. Our worry doesn't ever stop. So it's really great to be able to just take a moment and, you know, let them know that while you're here, it's about you. She says people seem less anxious after taking the time for themselves. Her employee loves to see their reactions after getting pampered. You know, they feel so beautiful. They get excited. They always want to come back. I'm a big fan. She says the I'm whole thing I'm was good, good from the beginning to the end. <laughs> They're also offering complimentary flowers and chocolates this Mother's Day. Sapphire Quarter, NTD News, New Jersey. New Yorkers may be able to see the rare sight of a NASA rocket launch on Saturday night, weather permitting, of course. NASA is set to launch a Black Brant 12 sounding rocket from their Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia this Saturday at 8.02 p.m. If the skies are clear, the launch should be visible all across the eastern seaboard, even from New York State. New Yorkers should be able to watch the launch 30 to 60 seconds after it launches, barring any delays. And coming up, do you want to a beauty or a beast for California? This is the slogan for a Gavin Newsom recall election candidate. He starts his campaign tour with an unusual companion, a 1,000 pound live bear. And the pandemic has created a nationwide flower shortage as production can't keep up with demand. So stay tuned to hear more. There's cultures that have been lost, but this culture hasn't been. The artist is showing us our sense of who we are, where we came from. You look at his hat. His hat is knitted probably by a man because a man traditionally knitted the hats. That hat tells you the story of who this person is, 
what his place in the culture is, the animals around him. Everything's all contained in the messages in the hat. And the tool that he's carrying over his shoulder. This is a centuries old tool that has been able to rework the mountains. Those traditions are invaluable, and if we don't honor those traditions, then we're rootless. The artist is showing us the value of maintaining our culture and respecting our culture. There's a nationwide flower shortage due to the pandemic, and people may see fewer bouquet varieties for Mother's Day. Here's NTD's Eileen Ang with more. Due to the pandemic, farms reduced flower production. However, there is a sudden demand for blossoms as Mother's Day approaches. Wholesalers, like this one behind me here, are especially busy in the morning. Peonies are a bestseller here. At United Wholesale Flowers, the supply can barely keep up with the demand since production hasn't returned to normal yet. Most of their flowers come from South America. As the shipment get transferred to Miami or, you know, different area, there was not enough fly. So, you know, the products didn't arrive on time. And then when the flowers get to Miami, a lot of um, trucking companies, they couldn't get enough driver to deliver them to the destinations. They do get some flowers grown in California, but most of the roses are from Colombia and Ecuador. They still have many shipments that haven't arrived yet. There are some differences this year compared to before. Everything is more last minute. People didn't know how much water they would get, so they didn't really know, know how to prepare for it. It's the same thing with us. We didn't get a lot of order until, you know, very late. These flowers are open to the public to buy, but most customers are small business owners. I'm planning to make flowers for Mother's Day. I love sunflowers, my story sunflowers decoration, so I love sunflowers. Another small business owner is planning to arrange flowers with goods and sell them as gifts on her Instagram page. Right now, the most of what people have asked is a single rose with four um, strawberries. So it's a box with um, one single rose and then it has four strawberries. It um, either spells mom or mom in Spanish. The business owners all expect to be busy as they have been receiving many orders. Eileen Ng, NTD News, California. A city planning commissioner in California is facing backlash for a comment he made while discussing an affordable housing project. Some are even calling to remove him from his position. NTD's Jason Blair has the details. John Stein has been planning commissioner in Livermore, California for 15 years, but now he's facing criticism for using the term ghetto in a meeting on April 20th. Stein must resign and take accountability for the harm he caused without excuses. During the meeting, the city council was considering a partly affordable housing development with Eden Housing. Stein said, I really don't want to see the downtown become a ghetto of affordable housing, and I support inclusionary housing both on a macro and micro scale. Some members of the community called into the meeting to defend the commissioner. Livermore is heading to its own ghetto. My son was held up by two men with a sawed-off shotgun held to his head and robbed in his car stolen. This happened as he got out of his car returning home from work. Surrounding apartments in that area is known and called by locals Crack Alley. That's a sign that the neighborhood right here in Livermore is a ghetto. He stated multiple times that he is for affordable housing, inclusive, affordable, inclusive housing, but was concerned that by putting all of the low-income housing together, namely segregated, that would cause stigma. Stein apologized on Monday. To anyone I may have hurt, I am sorry. He said it won't happen again. Council member Robert Carling made a motion to remove Stein, citing similar previous comments. To me, his comments taken in full, and I will emphasize taken in full, are insensitive, inexcusable, and inconsistent with our values. 
However, the motion failed with a 4-1 to one vote. Stein can stay, but on the condition that he enrolls in online training on certain topics. Livermore Council will continue to discuss the potential Eden housing project on May 24th. Jason Blair, NTD News, Cal. A Republican recall election candidate for California governor begins his statewide Meet the Beast bus tour on Tuesday with a live 1,000-pound bear. But the bear may have taken up too much of the spotlight during press conferences, drawing attention away from the political issues the candidate wants to focus on. John Cox, a Republican businessman who was endorsed by former President Trump in the 2018 election for California governor, is hitting the campaign trail again in the wild, wild west. But this time, Cox is accompanied by a live brown bear. And the bear, part of his branding as Beast John Cox, is prominently featured in his campaign ad, tour bus, and slogan. That's our choice, California. You want beauty? Pretty boy, pretty boy or a ball-busting beast, one who will never invite you to his $12,000 lobbyist-paid wine dinners at the French Laundry. Or the one I hope you want to have over for a beer. The bear is a symbol on the California state flag, and California was also known as the Bear State. The California grizzly bear, the official state animal, has been extinct since 1924. So Cox recruited a look-alike Kodiak bear named Tag for his tour. It's a wonderful animal. It's been raised in captivity, and it's a uh, you know it's a symbol of the big beastly changes that we need to make in California. So far, the bear seems to have been receiving far more media attention than Cox's policy talking points. Animal rights activists are criticizing Cox for violating a law signed by Governor Newsom that prohibits any person from using wild or exotic animals in a circus. But Cox says the recall campaign is not a circus and the bear is tame and well taken care of. As of now, the strategy seems to be working. A poll by Survey USA News found that Cox had the highest level of support among all the conservative candidates, with a 4% lead over former acting director of national intelligence Richard Grinnell and retired Olympic gold medalist Caitlyn Jenner. Coming up, Chinese communist leader Xi Jinping is calling himself the helmsman. He's the only party leader to ever use this title since Mao Zedong. And Tesla is planning to launch a new platform for their Chinese customers. It will allow car owners to look at their own vehicle data for the first time. That and more here on NTD News. The intelligence community is paying close attention to the Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping's new title. It's the same title communist dictator Mao Zedong used decades ago. Chinese Communist Party head Xi Jinping is the only party leader to ever use the title helmsman since former CCP leader Mao Zedong. The term implies his ultimate authority within the Communist Party. Last week, a top U.S. intelligence official analyzed this phenomenon at a Senate committee hearing. Senator, I think, I think uh, Xi is firmly uh, in control of the, the party uh, of the military in every aspect of Chinese uh, society. She first adopted the title helmsman last year. In an editorial last November, CCP mouthpiece Xinhua News gave Xi the title the core leader and the helmsman of the party. We've had several generals tell us that they know for a fact he has yes men around him. Besides Xi, Mao was also called the helmsman. The communist dictator was known for his personality cult and mass murder. He ruled China for nearly 30 years until his death, and his political movements were responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of people in China. This week, U.S.-based political analyst Gordon Chang tweeted about the issue, saying many China watchers insisted that Xi Jinping would never take the country back to Maoism. That's exactly what he's doing. The China analyst added that Xi is the most dangerous figure of our era. Former Hong Kong magazine editor Jin Zhong believes Xi wants to be the second Mao. He told Voice of America the term helmsman is worth keeping an eye on. Xi made himself Communist Party leader for life by revising the Constitution in 2018. Since becoming leader in 2012, Xi has been strengthening his personal power. He set up multiple groups and task forces with himself as the head. He even has more titles than his immediate predecessor. His many titles include leader of task forces of comprehensive reform, 
and leader of cybersecurity and information. Electric vehicle maker Tesla says it's developing a platform for car owners in China. It will allow them to access data generated by their vehicles. Ciara Lee reports. U.S. electric car maker Tesla will allow owners in China to access data generated by their vehicles. Tesla, which makes Model 3 sedans and Model Y sport utility vehicles at its Shanghai factory, aims to launch the new data platform this year. It will be the first time an automaker has allowed customers access to car data in the world's biggest auto market. Manufacturers have increasingly been equipping vehicles with cameras and sensors to capture images of a car's surroundings. Controlling the use, sending and storage of these images is a challenge for regulators around the world. China last month published draft rules on the issue. In April, a Tesla customer, angry over the handling of her complaint about malfunctioning brakes, climbed on top of a Tesla car in a protest at the Shanghai Auto Show. Tesla then complied with a local authority order to provide the data related to the brake incident to the customer. Coming up, France is facing an outbreak of violence with nightly riots and two policemen killed within the span of 11 days. And the EU gets involved in the fishing dispute between France and the UK. They're calling for calm. Find out more in just a moment here on NTD News. Is France facing a surge of violent acts? Many in the country are asking, following the recent death of two police officers and big city riots increasing in frequency and severity. NTD's France correspondent David Vives has more. A French policeman was shot dead on Wednesday in the south of France while trying to apprehend a man in the center of a city. The policeman was killed during what the media described as a routine police raid. According to this policeman, it's part of an increasing number of assaults against police in France in recent months. I'm very sad. The policeman's children and his wife will never see him again. But I'm also very angry. We are more and more being attacked from everywhere. I'm not even talking of gangsters. The attacks now come from common thugs. This follows the murder of a police woman 11 days ago. An Islamist terrorist killed the woman inside a police station. Two days ago, this Paris residents threw fireworks at drug dealers, trying to chase them out of their district. This is the point we're at. The police can't do anything. We're even being told not to intervene in some cases. So the population is beginning to organize themselves against drug dealers. Police are also under increasing scrutiny, following accusations of racism. Our government says one day that we are discriminating against people during police checks, and the next day they support us. They have to choose a side. For my part, I defend the policemen. President Emmanuel Macron said last week 30,000 more policemen will be recruited to address the outbreak of violence across the country. According to a poll released on April 25th, 86% of French people say security will be a deciding factor in the next presidential election one year from now. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. The UK and Jersey's governments are reaching out to France and the EU in a bid to resolve the fishing rights dispute. This after a flotilla of French fishing boats protested in the Channel Islands main harbor and the UK sent a maritime patrol vessels on Thursday. Diplomatic efforts intensified to prevent a repeat of Thursday's Jersey fishing dispute. Britain's Environment Secretary says the UK government is working with both France and the EU to resolve the issue. Uh, we stand ready to continue to engage with the European Commission uh, and indeed France, but also you know, the Jersey authorities themselves have made clear that they want to be pragmatic here. Britain withdrew its Royal Navy vessels from the waters off Jersey on Thursday, but said it would remain on standby to support the Channel Island. France and Britain both deployed maritime patrol vessels to the area. That's after a flotilla of French trawlers sailed in protest to Jersey's main harbour. French fishermen say they're being unfairly deprived of access to rich fishing grounds off the coast of Jersey after having operated there for years because they couldn't prove their historical links with the waters. 
The European Union called for calm while also accusing Jersey of breaching the deal signed. Jersey says it's following the rules for issuing licenses set out in the trade deal. The Jersey government says it's a process. We've started the process and of course there are some growing pains, which means that uh, um, the fishermen on both sides had perfectly legitimate uh, grievances that we have been trying to sort out. The UK government says that the post-Brexit trade agreement with the EU from last year has changed things. We want to be helpful here. Where there is historic access, we will respect that. But it's also the case that the trade and cooperation agreement has changed things. And so uh, the the access uh, that's there and the conditions on that access have changed. The Jersey government talked to the fishermen on Thursday. A representative of Normandy Fishermen says that talks were one-sided and that no progress had been made. He said the French government needs to proceed with retaliatory measures. The French maritime minister said this week France could cut electricity to Jersey if its fishermen are not granted full access to UK waters under the post-Brexit trading terms. Coming up, scientists rescue a rare kind of sea snail with the help of a chemical love potion. An elderly resident from a nursing home outside Madrid gets some much needed relief from the pandemic with a trip to the local zoo. Stay tuned for more here on NTD News. Kids will be kids, which just goes to say kids will be curious. They get into everything, everything. If there's a loaded firearm in the house, they could get their hands on that too. Keeping firearms locked, unloaded, and stored separately from ammunition in a place inaccessible to kids can help keep your loved ones safe from family fire. Safe gun storage saves lives. Thank you. White abalone, whose flesh is a delicacy and polished shell is prized as mother of pearl, are threatened with extinction. But scientists are looking to turn the tide for these unique sea snails by playing Cupid. These giant wild sea snails are often unlucky in love. Abalone are terrible at long distance relationships. The white abalone that are left in the wild are so far apart from one another that they can't reproduce successfully on their own out there. It's breeding day for the endangered white abalone at a University of California laboratory in Bodega Bay. Scientist Kristin Aquilino and her team are up before dawn, scooping up their snails and preparing to matchmake. White abalone are on the brink of extinction. They cannot come back without our help. So what we're doing here is we're bringing them closer together. We're putting them in a really romantic solution of hydrogen peroxide to get them to release those gametes for us so that we can combine them in a laboratory setting and create offspring that will end up back out in the wild. It's a day-long process involving a long soak in what researchers refer to as a chemical love potion, a lot of patience and a true wingman's hope that the bottom dwellers get in the mood to release their sperm and eggs. We try to give them a little bit of rest. These are endangered animals. We want to make sure we're not stressing them out too much. They are really, really precious. The structure right here is the gonad and the coloration can tell us what sex it is. If it's a little bit more yellow, it's probably a male. If it's a little more gray, it's probably a female. There's a lot riding on the process. The white abalone has been on the federal endangered species list since 2001, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. With overfishing, low reproduction rates and disease all bringing the invertebrates population numbers to historic lows. One of this year's highlights has been introducing ultrasound technology into the process. 
Elderly residents from a nursing home outside Madrid relished the fresh air and freedom of a guided tour around the city's zoo on Wednesday. Around 50 residents and staff from a Madrid nursing home, all of them vaccinated, were whisked through the zoo's leafy trails on a miniature train and introduced to some of the park's most charismatic inhabitants. It's their first organized excursion since the pandemic struck last spring. It's good to leave to break the metonymy of the nursing home, especially as we've been confined there for so long. It's nice to get outside, so I decided to go out and see the world. 80-year-old Mariana Valdera was thrilled to see a wide range of animals, from pandas and elephants to birds. I feel here as if I was in my village many years ago, in the middle of nature listening to the birds, which I haven't heard for a long time. So for me, it's a great day. Nearly 43,000 elderly people in Spanish nursing homes died of the CCP virus, or a suspected infection, during the first wave of the pandemic. After such a devastating loss, authorities prioritize the vaccination of people who work and live in care homes, achieving nearly total coverage by the end of February. Cristina Verde, director of the Casa Verde nursing home, stressed the importance of being able to return to some semblance of normality. Today was a very exciting day. They were really looking forward to going out again, to getting back to normality, to being able to do this activity in the open air, enjoy nature, the animals at the zoo, it's really good. Today we have forgotten about pains. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.